Hello, and welcome to the 92nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 9th of January, 2019, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, we invite back Michael Roberts to the show to discuss the new book, World in Crisis, a global analysis of Marx's law of profitability, he co-edited with Guglielmo Carcedi. This week, we have the new Patreon subscribers, Andre P., and Jared S. to thank. If you'd like to help the show, you too can become a patron. Patrons get all the shows a few days early and also get to vote on and participate in the reading group series. If you'd like to comment, please do so on the YouTube channel. Also, make sure to like, subscribe and share. And you can join me on Facebook or Twitter too. OK, to the interview. Okay, Michael. Well, thanks for coming on the show again. Today, we're discussing your latest book out a couple of months ago, I think, called World in Crisis, a Global Analysis of Marx's Law of Profitability. This was edited by yourself and Guglielmo Carcedi. He's your co-editor and also a writer of papers inside. Can you tell us in broad strokes what this book is and what it's about? Well, uh, Guigalum and, my, and myself decided that we wanted to bring to readers a better explanation and also a confirmation of the importance of Marx's law of the tendency of rate of profit to fall. Why did we want to do that? Because we see that law that Marx expounded in various works, but in particularly volume three of Capital, um, as the kernel and the centre towards understanding why there are crises under capitalism on a regular and recurring basis, and also why capitalism increasingly is finding it difficult to develop the productive forces and deliver what people need around the world. And and what the law tells us is that over time, there is a tendency for the profitability of the capitalist sector to decline, despite all their efforts in competition and driving and exploiting working people, Uh, to try and get profits up. There is a tendency for that profitability of overall capital invested to fall over time. Uh, And that law means that it pushes the position to a level where profits can fall and investment starts falling on a regular and recurring basis. So we get cycles of booms and slumps under capitalism. Uh, We, uh, Carcady and I, among other Marxist economists, think that this is a key to us understanding the nature of crises under capitalism. And therefore, we not only wanted to theoretically uh, show that that has a logical base to it, uh, which many uh, economists, and I mean other Marxist economists, disagree with. They don't consider this law as being relevant to crises. Some famous uh, Marxists in the history of, of Marxism, like Rosa Luxemburg and others, completely dismissed it but we think it is the most important law. And we wanted to show not only only that it was logically a good reason and explanation for crisis, but also that we could empirically validate that the law was operating. And how do you do that? Well, you have to go and measure uh, whether the rate of profit in capitalist economies around the world has been falling over time on a long-term tendency and also has movements which suggest that it will create the conditions for crises at certain points. So we got together a load of mainly young authors from around the world, um, in Europe, in Japan, in Latin America, in North America, uh, and in Southern Europe as well, um, to bring together their own empirical studies of the law of the rate of profit and see whether the rate, what happens to the rate of profit and how it affects crises. So we brought this together as a compilation of essays, including both uh, Guigoma, Carcades, and my essays, but also chapters by all these young authors. And I think the book presents a very compelling uh, argument and evidence for saying that the law of profitability is very central to us understanding why there are crises under capitalism. Michael, where did you find all these young authors? I've heard of some of the names, but there's a lot of them I never heard of before. Well, um, of course... uh, those who read my blog know that I spend an awful lot of time reading stuff all over the place and uh, chasing up people. I tend to send 
if I see a paper in a journal or something which looks ill interesting and relevant to me, I contact the author. I try to establish communication with them. And often we, uh, we Marxist economists and left economists go to all these academic conferences and other conferences like that, and we all meet up with each other. And quite often in my case, uh, because I've had this blog that I regularly post on over the last uh, several years, that produces uh, people contacting me and saying, look, have you heard about what I've been doing? And then we get into contact. So that's how it's really happened. And some of them are young PhD students. They're not even lecturers. Some of them are more established. But over a period of time, we built up this network of contacts. And that's led to the choice. And I've, I mean, there are very men, some very eminent Marxist economists who are not in this uh, uh, book, this compilation, like Andrew Kleiman, Fred Mosley, others. But in a way, we've deliberately, Mina Karkady and I have deliberately left them out for two reasons. One, we wanted the younger uh, authors to have an opportunity to publish in, in the book. And also, we wanted to concentrate on the period after the Great Recession of 2009 to see what has happened uh, and not look before. Look, so the book doesn't really discuss so much, although it does that as well. The causes leading up to the Great Recession of 2009, which most listeners will know about, but uh, looks at the general nature of the, of the process of crises, in particular what's happened since 2009 as well. There are some very interesting articles in there on the empirical evidence from different areas of the world. Can you give us a little detail on what is the evidence from all over the globe for this law of tenential fall or rate of profit? Yes, well, most uh, measures of the rate of profit have been concentrated on the United States. And that's quite understandable for two reasons. First of all, the United States is still the most important capitalist economy in the world by some distance. I know we could argue that other economies begin to rival it in size, like uh, China and others, but still the case that the US is the most important capitalist economy, has the biggest financial sector, it has the most important companies in the world, and uh, it's still uh, the largest uh, per capita economy in the world, and therefore it is central to the nature of world capitalism. So most Marxist economists uh, who want to analyze what's going on in world capitalism look at the US. That's the first reason. The second reason is that US economic data is by far the best and most comprehensive in the world. Uh, the US government agencies spend a lot of time compiling statistics. This is obviously so they can see what's going on in the capitalist economy as well. Uh, and out of those statistics, we can draw fairly accurate and uh, uh, useful evidence from a Marxist point of view on the nature of profit, uh, capital costs, and so on, which mainly mainstream economists don't look at, but we can draw from that the official statistics. So much of the work that has done, been done empirically over, the say, the last 10 to 15 years on the, the rate of profit and the world capitalist economy has used the US as its model. And there hasn't been much outside of that. Uh, some of the best books on uh, uh, the nature of the rate of profit, like Andrews Kleiman's Failure of Capitalist Production, concentrates entirely on the United States for those reasons. So, But you can go further than that. And other people have looked at the national statistics in their countries to see what has been happening with the rate of profit. And what we find, uh, Tom, is that, uh, surprise, surprise, that the tendencies or trends that we see in the US economy for the rate of profit are also more or less mirrored, not entirely, but often mirrored in other countries. And we've looked in the book, we have authors who look at Brazil, at Mexico, at Japan, at Greece, at uh, uh, various parts of Europe, and of course the UK. So, and when we look at that, we find that the similar, but if we want to take, say, at least the uh, the post-war period uh, since 1945, the second half of the 20th century, a general decline in the rate of profit in all these economies, and then a recovery from about the mid-1980s up to the end of the century before a little bit of a downturn again. That was the US experience on the whole for most people who have measured it, and it appears that it applies to most of these countries, even the so-called emerging economies like Brazil uh, and so on. 
Um, so this is, gives us, uh, as it were, uh, confidence that when we're looking at uh, this law of profitability, it has some general application across the world by using the statistics of various countries provided by these authors. There was one very interesting paper in there by a guy you put me on to before previously, Esteban Maito. Yes. And I tried to get him on the show before, but he said he, he was not that good and confident with his English. So it's it's interesting. There's one graph he has there where he yeah. has, I think on page 147, if anybody has the book at all, the graph, figure 4.9, he's done a, a core country's rate of profit for yeah. the capitalist economy. Do you want to talk about that graph? Yeah. I think it's a very important uh, essay or chapter in the book. And if, if for no other reason uh, for buying the book, it's worth buying that to read Esteban Maito's. I'll, I'll, there's another chapter which I particularly like as well, excluding my own, of course, Tom, uh, <laughs> is that, um, uh, which is by um, uh, Jose Tapia, which I'll come back to, but maybe we can discuss a bit later. But Esteban Maito's chapter, uh, for listeners and readers, is explains, looks at the whole world. He's one of the few people who's attempted to compile, if you like, a world rate of profit. And what he's done is he's taken as many countries as he can get statistics on, and he uses 14 in total, and he's, he's as it were, averaged out the rate of profit in those countries using the statistics to come up with a sort of global rate of profit. And as you say, Tom, he in particular looks at what he calls the core countries, that is, the major capitalist economies in Europe, the United States and Japan, calls that the core. And if you look at the core, we can see what happens with the core rate of profit over a period of time, going way back, going back to 1855, so that we can get a really good picture. And it, it shows that uh, over that long period, Marx's uh, prediction, if you like, or uh, claim uh, in volume three of capital, that the law of the tenants rate of profit will operate over time and drive the rate of profit down has proved to be correct. The rates of profit of the core countries, um, which he explains in his chapter back in the 19th century, are much higher than they are at the end of the 20th century, something like 50% lower now over that period of time. Not in a straight line. There are periods when what Marx called the counteracting factors to his law operates, and there's been a there was a rise in the rate of profit. These are particularly in periods like in wars, when there's a complete transformation of cost of capital, both through physical destruction and the devaluation and liquidation of large sectors of capital to restart again, but also in other areas too. But so, but nevertheless, if you look over the long-term period of uh, say 150 years, the rate of profit in these core countries has fallen and that therefore the law is confirmed. And that's what Maito shows dramatically in his uh, chapter. One of the other interesting things, Tom is in Maito's chapter, he says, and this is a question I often get asked at conferences when I refer to Esteban Maito's work, but which by the way, I continually pinch at my conferences. Um, he, he's, people say to him, well, if the rate of profit's been falling, what is it gonna go to zero? What happens then? Uh, and it's uh, an important question to, not a silly question, it's an important question to ask because, and Mito shows at the end of that chapter that obviously there are counteracting factors, in particular slumps. Slumps create the conditions where the rate of profit is reversed and risen, uh, rises so that capitalism can start again once it's cleansed out all the old capital and sacked all of us workers so that we're all unemployed till we can restart again. That process of cleansing raises the rate of profit. So the rate of profit, while it is over a very long horizon, is gradually moving towards zero, if you like. It's continually reversed for periods of time by slumps. So it's, an, it's like looking along the horizon, looking for the island on the horizon, and you never seem to quite get there. He even makes estimates how long it would take. It's asymptotic here. The latest estimate would be it wouldn't get to zero before 2065. But of course, it, in 2065, it won't be at zero, assuming nothing else changes, because there'll be a series of slumps before then, which will change the trajectory of the rate of profit. I hope that's understandable to listeners and readers. What I meant to make the point is, is that Mito's chapter provides you with a very clear understanding of the way in which the rate of profit operates globally. And that's what makes that chapter so important. 
Yeah, it's quite striking when you see the graph. I might use it as a visual for the episode because it's such a kind of striking graph that I think in 1869 on the graph, it shows the rate of profit for the globe at around 40, 41%. Yeah. And it's gone all the way down pretty much, pretty closely fitted to a line all the way down to 2009, 2010. And it's down at about 10 or 11, 12%. Yeah. So it's like, it's nearly, by the looks of it, nearly quartered over the 140 years. So it's like 25% of what it was. So it, it seems to be, a, a at the very least, a strong signal in the economy. Yes, and also it's a, it's a big confirmation of what Marx wrote in Volume 3 of Capital. That's the point that we editors are particularly keen on, on presenting to readers because, as you say, it means that readers and listeners should be aware that if they want to know what's, how healthy the world capitalist economy is, just look at the long-term profit rate, as Mito expresses in that chapter, and you can see that capitalism is getting more unhealthy or sicker decade by decade, not in a straight line. And there are periods of prosperity or relative recovery in health, but overall, capitalism is a system which is transient. It's getting sicker. It's no longer providing... Uh, the development of the productive forces as it did 150 years ago or whatever when Marx wrote Capital, it is now a much more uh, debilitated and degraded system which needs to be replaced. It's interesting, those estimates you talk about, the idea of the profit rate should go asymptotically to zero, that he has done these kind of best fits lines. I'm looking at it here now and the first one, from 1900 says, you know, <laughs> that we should be to 0% profit by 1994. Yeah. And then each like crisis is a different line. And by 2010, it was predicting it by about 2054 or something. So yeah. you can see this idea of like, well, it looks like it's going to head towards zero, but kind of never truly get there. It's That's a never the moving of... horizon, which is obviously partly mathematical. It's, a, it's much more difficult to, to move from it's much easier to move from 40 to 10 over 150 years than it is to move from 10 to zero over the next 100 years. That's true. Ironically, just as, as I'm doing the interview now, I'm actually reading a book which I think is pretty linked to this paper, which is the Henrik Grossman Law of Accumulation and Breakdown of the Capitalist System. Yeah. What it, do you think about that kind of thesis of this idea of a, of a, of a breakdown or... The right. Grossman well, mix. I, I would recommend this to readers and listeners, Henry Grossman's book. I mean, it's a masterpiece in my view and something it should be dipped into by anybody who's interested in this subject on a regular basis that they want to answer to a lot of questions. Um, now, it's often, it's called the law of, the, he refers to the breakdown of capitalism, but he also has a subtitle which he says it's, uh, he's not saying that capitalism just goes to, as you were, profit rate to zero and everything collapses, or profit rate gets so low that everything collapses forever. He said, in the book, he explains that it's the counteracting factors which will enable capitalism for periods of time to sustain the profit rate and sustain things. But he's making two points there in the book, which I think is similar to what uh, uh, Mito is making and also we make in the book in general, that capitalism... O is a, a transient system. It cannot last without just producing ever decreasing, ever increasing crises and slumps, which uh, damage the livelihoods of billions across the world on a regular basis. And the situation will get worse in the 21st century than it did before as a result. But also capitalism is going to disappear of its own uh, demise. It's going to require action, political and conscious action by people to change the system of, of social organisation which they have. Otherwise, what will happen is not breakdown so much, but a continuation of these crises with ever degrees of uh, disaster, a bit like climate change. Things will just get worse unless we do something about it and we can't go on forever letting it get worse. And that, that's, a, I think, quite a good analogy to the way in which Grossman describes it, and also in the way in which uh, Mino Karkady in one of his chapters describes it, that capitalism seems to have exhausted itself, but nothing has replaced it yet. So we're in this sort of limbo land where the crises just get worse 
nothing is done about it and we can only expect uh, a worse situation in the 21st century if we continue the way we are now. So kind of what he is saying then, see if I can say this coherently, is that we have this kind of idea of where it gets to such a kind of a stagnant state where there are like crises, but it, it never manages to get back to boom. It just manages to not produce at a, at a high rate. So each, each recovery would mean that maybe growth will be less low than it was in the previous recovery, economic growth. Uh, incomes for the average person will not rise as much as they did before, if at all. At the moment, we've seen in the last 10 years that 80% that of households in the major economies, on average, have seen no rise in their real incomes since the end of the Great Recession in 2009. It's been a completely depressionary period in terms of incomes. That's the sort of thing that we could see over the next few decades unless something changes and, and possibly worse. And, and we, of course, we know also there are increasing challenges for capitalism, if you like, existential ones like climate change caused by capitalism's rapacious, rapacious drive for profit, causing huge emissions into the air, warming up the climate so that it is creating a situation of disaster. But... Uh, if nothing's done about it, then that situation will get worse. And that's what you will see with, within the economic system itself, that if nothing's done about it, this current crisis would be overcome by a slump maybe, and then you'd have a bit of a recovery, but it'd be a relatively weak one compared to what we've seen in the past. And then someday down the road, we would go back into another slump, demonstrating yet again uh, that uh, Marx's law is in operation and it's increasingly making it, uh, explaining to us how difficult it is for capitalism to keep recovery. Yeah, so one one concept in that book was that the idea of when it gets to this low rate of profit scenario, it creates a reserve army of labour, essentially. It's not able to employ enough people to keep the capital valorised and growing. So when we get to, say, Marx's idea of socialism, is Marx making a kind of a thermodynamic argument here, whereby capitalism is bound to fail because it ends up in a scenario where the system is not efficient compared to, say, a, what a planned economy is. And once you have a, a breakthrough of a kind of a planned economy style thing, it will usher in a new dominant phase. Is, is, is he really making a kind of a thermodynamic argument? Well, I think that's, I think there's, uh, yeah, I think there's an element of that in it that, that Marx is saying that uh, capitalism was, a, as we know, uh, he wrote a lot about saying how capitalism was a tremendous uh, booster to productive forces, to use his phrase, which means the expansion of output through the use of technology and the latest uh, knowledge that we have and the, the uh, mobilizing the power of human labor to produce more not necessarily for everybody, but just to produce more. And that we've never seen such an expansion of output per person in the history of the of human organization, except under capitalism from, say, over the last 200 years. And you only have to look at the data, long-term data on output and incomes to, to see that. And also, that's the other thing he said in his, in his writings back in the 1840s, 1850s, well, and in capital, was the massive expansion of this system globally. For the first time, we have a, a, a social organization, a system of organizing human activity uh, through markets, through the production for profit, through big capitalist countries. It combines globally. Every world now, every, the tentacle of capitalism is everywhere, where in previous social systems under fusion and socialism, a savory that did not exist, didn't go globally. It was different in different parts. This has became a huge dominant system uh, on the world in social organization. And that means that the powers that be, the ideology of that system is all powerful. Everybody thinks this is the only system you can have. It's the only system we've ever had and the only system we will ever have. This is the line presented to us in the media every day by governments, by officials, uh, by economic experts. Uh, capitalism is it. There is no alternative. Uh, and yet, what this book we're trying to show here is that actually capitalism is not going to last. It's in a, 
the increasingly bad situation, difficult situation, it cannot continue to do that. It, and because it's global, it now opens up the opportunity for us to change the system globally in the interests of the vast majority. And that means, uh, and the reason it can't last is because it can't develop the, the technology and the forces of innovation which human labor power's got in an effective way because profit, it only does it for profit and profit is struggling to be sustained and will be struggle to be sustained over the next decades or so. So in, in a way, the only way we can develop all the new technology that's coming through in biology, in artificial intelligence, in robots, in uh, areas that will improve uh, life expectancy and health, all these areas in transport and communications, all that will only really be possible through a planned economy where we devote all the resources to producing what people need and to break with a system where only production is only for profit. So getting back, you said you would like to talk about another chapter of the book by uh, Jose Tapia. Yes, Jose Tapia presents us, and I think it's quite a, a, a nice chapter for readers to take in because Jose explains that um, what's key, and as I've just said before to a capitalist economy, is whether profits are growing or falling. Now, this isn't a view accepted by the majority, not only uh, by the majority of mainstream economics. For those who look at mainstream economics, their argument is uh, that what uh, gets an economy growing well is people spending money in the shops, consumer spending, or capitalists spending money, uh, employing people and uh, investing in things and producing things. So spending is what counts. This is a view of the Keynesians. The Keynesian, uh, John Maynard Keynes presented a view that what was wrong with capitalism was that sometimes spending collapsed and that it's the aim of uh, to, to sort this out, to manage capitalism better, we needed to give an artificial boost to spending and everything will be fine. Now, what Jose Tapia shows in this book is that the Keynesian view isn't actually empirically correct, that what matters in a capitalist economy is whether profits are going up and down. And profits lead investment, not the other way around. And he shows this empirically by looking at the US economy and shows that what drives investment and spending up is actually whether profits are going up or down. And he, by showing this empirically, he presents to us a very clear argument that Marx was right, that what matters in, in a capitalist economy is what's happening uh, to profit. And he also shows very interestingly how many mainstream economists who looked at the empirical evidence also reached the same conclusion. So you have a contradiction in mainstream economics between those who look at things theoretically, like the neoclassical economists, who basically say, which is the main thing that is taught in universities, is that the market economy works absolutely fine as long as government doesn't interfere. And the only reason we have crises is because it's a sort of shock that comes from outside the system, like an asteroid hitting the Earth, uh, caused by... You know, uh, political events which are out of the control of economies. And then the other half of mainstream economics is Keynesian ones, which says, yes, there is a problem, but all we need to do is boost spending. And But these are theoretical arguments. When you look at the empirical evidence, which is what this book is mainly about, the empirical evidence doesn't confirm either of these theories, that it's just a shock or it's just the lack of spending. In fact, what it confirms, as Jose Tapia's chapter shows, is the crises come when profits fall, and that fall leads to a fall in investment, and that's when you get crises. That's when you get problems in the capitalist economy, and everything depends on the profitability and the profits of capital. And Jose shows that even mainstream economists who looked at the evidence also find that. And when they do find that, it's quickly dismissed by the conventional wisdom in mainstream economics. It's interesting because a number of Marxists even go for that they quote the work of Kaleski and his accounting identities to say that you know the capitalists can choose their rate of profit by not spending on luxury goods and increasing their consumption can you talk about that a bit yes well um one of my big uh, bugbears is um 
Now, I don't know if the readers or listeners know that Mikhail Kaleski is a Polish uh, Marxist, Keynesian economist, Marxist economist, who was uh, do, publishing and writing and researching at the same time as Keynes and eventually came into contact with Keynes, but he was in parallel with Keynes, he was developing uh, an explanation of the capitalist economy as he saw it, which he saw uh, somewhat from Marx's point of view. He saw profit as being important. He said that the, the issue was really the distribution of between profit and wages, and that if uh, wages were going up too much and squeezing profits, uh, then uh, profits would uh, fall and there could be a crisis. On the other hand, if profits go up too much, wages are too low and there could be a crisis because of a decline in the ability of workers to buy things. So you had a conflict between profit and wages, distribution uh, conflict. And uh, he then sort of connected with uh, Keynes's view that we should look at spending, in particular investment spending. And he concluded that... Um, the way that we should consider a capitalist economy is that actually it's investment that matters and investment creates profits. So if capitalists invest, they sell things and they make a profit. So profit comes, as it were, as a result of capitalists investing and producing, which, if you think about it, uh, is a bit of an odd argument because why would they invest and produce unless they made a profit? Uh, so the real, surely the real question is whether uh, capitalists will only invest and produce if, if they make a profit. So, yes, you could say that the, the macro identity, which is a sort of looking at the economy as a whole and saying what equals what, you could say that investment equals profit. I won't go into the full explanation of that. But the question is, which way round is it? Is profits leading to investment or is investment leading to profit? And Kaleski and Keynes, or particularly Kaleski, said it was the latter, investment leads to profit. Uh, Keynes said something similar. Uh, Marx, I think Marxists would say that profits leads to investment and Tapia's chapter attempts to prove that empirically. But as you say, Tom, there's a big disagreement amongst Marxists. They, a lot of Marxists will hold to the Kaleski view. And therefore, in, a, in my view, and I think in the view of the editors of the book, which is what this is about, it's an incorrect position because it leads to a belief that profits are irrelevant to crises. And what matters is what uh, capitalists are thinking about, but what choices they're making on investment, uh, as you put it. And so, the World in Crisis book gives you empirical evidence to say that the uh, Kaleski view is wrong, that it is profitability that really matters. So Tapia's work says profits drop, investment drops. Yeah. And Kaleski are saying capitalists decide to drop their investment and therefore profit drops. That would be yeah, the cause. And we can also look at the causal factor. If you like a correlation, those of you who know a little bit of mathematics know that you can correlate two things together uh, so that the correlation between profits and investment is very high. But what is the causal connection which leads the other? And Tapia gives us an attempt statistically to show that the causal connection is from profits to investment, not the other way around. There are statistical techniques which allow us to make that uh, conclusion, at least to some degree. Uh, the Granger causation, I won't go too technical here, but basically it says we can look at statistics, uh, said Granger, and we can see whether the idea that one causes the other is not valid and see how valid, see how probable that is. And in fact, if we say the profits does not cause investment, and then we look at the statistics and we find that that uh, statement is pretty well unlikely. So it implies the opposite, that profits does cause investment. That's as far as we can get with statistics. <laughs> uh, lies in statistics. <laughs> yes, it's like, so it's like saying the opposite. You know, if, we, if we can show that it's very unlikely that profits don't cause investment, we can conclude that profits do cause investment. So then you have a, a sequence of articles on stuff like the derivatives markets, high frequency trading. I haven't read too much Marxist stuff talking on this. Do you want to give us a little overview on, on what the core ideas are here in these chapters? Yeah, I think I'd like to give you a, a, a bit of a, a general statement about this, just because what we want to say is that the book, although it's about Marx's law of profitability, it wants to tell you, tell the readers that, we're not, as it were, monocausal. We're just saying that the, 
the crises and the what's wrong with capitalism is purely down. Just look at profitability. But that is the underlying force behind crises under capitalism, the book argues. But at different levels of reality, other things are causing the trigger or the start of these crises. Um, I, I was thinking of a the way to think about the difference between uh, prediction and forecast. The law of profitability predicts that there will be crises on regular and recurring basis because of changes in profitability, in, in particular the fall in profitability. But it doesn't forecast when they will happen. Uh, forecasts are a bit different from prediction and forecasts are much more difficult and there are other factors that come in in particular the book shows in a sec in a whole section that what's happening with the amount of debt that capitalists have built up over a period of time can have a s significant effect on when these crises take place and in particular in the period before the global financial crash of 2008 there was a massive increase in the amount of debt held by private sector uh, companies and households around the world and in, and this was also um, leveraged up by a massive amount of uh, speculation in all sorts of what are called derivatives which are in, in effect financial instruments uh, for use on betting on whether a debt is the value of debt is going to go up or down so just think about this readers and listeners it's not uh, capitalist speculation in stock markets and bond markets and other financial markets is not just about whether stocks are going to go up, that is, the share price is going to go up or down, or the bond price is going to go up or down, but also about whether um, if, we, if we have a bunch of mortgages and we estimate uh, what they're worth, we can speculate on those, or we can speculate on whether there's going to be a crash or not, or we can speculate on speculate. So we can bet about on just on everything. I don't know what happens um, elsewhere in the world, but in the UK, if you watch a sports program, when we have an advert, it's full of betting ads. And it's about being able to bet on just about anything you like, the time of the day, uh, the change in the weather, everything. And these derivatives are a form of financial speculation which reached that extreme. So it dramatically increased the amount of borrowing and debt that was going into speculating in the market and really raised the level of crash that eventually came in 2008. And in the chapters in this book, we discuss how the role of derivatives and debt in relation to uh, profitability in the capitalist economy and how the financial sector has grown in size as a result of the fall in the rate of profit and therefore creates an extra risk and burden and weight upon the capitalist economy, particularly the productive sectors when it crashes. So a financial crash can cause an even bigger fall in the productive sectors of the economy as a result. And finally, you have a section then on the euro crisis. This is from you know, yourself and the co-editor Guglielmo Carcadi. What is your take on the roots of the euro crisis? Yeah, well, it's very it's interesting because we know that uh, next week, uh, well, January the 1st, New Year's Day, will mean that the euro has existed for exactly 20 years. So it's a little bit of an anniversary. And uh, perhaps we should all be looking back at seeing whether this experiment introduced by Franco-German capitalism and the European Union to integrate further financially and with the, with the introduction of a single currency for now, what is it, 17 countries, um, within the European Union, or all have used the euro as their currency and not their own national currency. It's this experiment of trying to integrate and uh, solidify Europe as an economic force in the world through a single currency, how well that uh, experiment has gone on. Gone. And I think you'd have to say, and what the chapters in this book try to show, is that for the top countries, like France and Germany, in many ways, it's been a success because they've got a currency which uh, allows them to, to expand their capital across uh, the Eurozone area to make more profit uh, with ending of transaction costs and foreign exchange costs. And also because the euro has been in many ways a little weaker than the German, old German currency, the drachma, it has meant that German exports have been very competitive in the world uh, by, you know, on the basis of a euro currency. But for the weaker capitalist economies within the Eurozone, like Greece and Italy, it's been 
more, more or less a disaster. It has really reduced their ability to compete. They've been uh, shackled by an interest rate decided by the European, uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, and they have a currency which is too strong for their exports to compete on the world market. So they have lost ground uh, in shares of the market and in shares of uh, GDP uh, to Germany, in particular, and Netherlands and the Northern European countries. And of course, we know that during the uh, Great Recession and the collapse of uh, global financial institutions, uh, these Eurozone countries of the South, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and of course, Greece, suffered heavily with huge debts that they built up to the north of Europe, um, which put them in a position where they, they faced basically a severe depression, particularly in the case of Greece, where GDP fell by 40% and incomes have collapsed and pensions have been decimated. And, the, and a whole generation of Greeks face uh, permanent austerity as we go forward. So uh, the Eurozone and the introduction of the euro has been a disaster for those countries. But what these two chapters add, most importantly, and I think this is important uh, to make, is that this crisis in the eurozone that happened from say 2012 onwards was not was partly a product of a single currency existing but also was mainly a product of the collapse of capitalism globally this would not have happened to these countries um, within the euro uh, if it hadn't been for the collapse of global capitalism the fall in profitability and the great recession and that the uh, explosion of this crisis across the globe affected the eurozone as well and those who argue that greece would have been fine if it had not been in the euro or italy would have been fine if not been in the euro i don't think can find support for that argument in the evidence that we provide in the books whether you're in or out of the euro you suffered during that global crisis one of the things that say a big currency like the united states has is that they have redistribution mechanisms so if the exchange rate or the policies are in favor of, say, the big states like California and New York, that Alabama and these, they get uh, redistribution mechanisms to bring them up. In the Eurozone, it's baked in the cake that we don't have them. Yep. Are we going to end up with a very stratified Europe then between, you know, north and south and periphery? I think so. I mean, if you were uh, a dictator of the Eurozone, um, and even the German government isn't. Uh, then, I'm, working on, I'm working on it, Michael, I'm working on it. <laughs> if you were, then you would want to go further with integration. You would want to introduce what you've just described, which is a fiscal union. So the richer parts of the United States, like New York or California and so on, contribute more in tax taxes to the federal budget than the poor places like Mississippi. And there's a redistribution of income to the poorer places through the fact that they get more unemployment benefit and they pay less taxes and they get uh, and so on. So there's a redistribution. Now, in a nation state like the United States or the UK, people on the whole accept that because they consider their one nation. So they, they think the idea of a national budget, which may lead to a redistribution in the UK, for example, from London to Newcastle is on the whole a good idea. Wales, for example, in the UK, is totally and permanently in deficit when it comes to the fiscal uh, basis of their economy. They depend on the dis redistribution of revenues in order to sustain their public services and other, in other organisations in Wales. But we, Britain, the Londoners don't yet demand that Wales be kicked out of the UK, United Kingdom as a result because they see it as one a nation state. That doesn't exist in Europe or the Eurozone. Uh, people still see themselves as separate nation states. There is no fiscal union. And, and so there is the only redistribution takes place is very limited indeed through various uh, social funds and so on. There isn't an automatic fiscal union which could create that. A dictatorship of, the, of Germany would probably like that so that it can ensure uh, a completely united uh, federal European Union, although there are also elements in the German uh, elite who don't want that because that means it, it's going to cost them a bit more. 
uh, and they're not really interested in say helping Greece and Italy and Spain and so on. So that if we continue with this, what you might call a halfway house, where you have a single currency, a common market, a customs union, and some uh, general agreement on tariffs and legislation, but you don't have fiscal union, uh, then you will just continue to get what you, as you correctly say, a stratified position, which will get even more unequal. And the real risk is that the next big slump, uh, the European uh, currency union and even the European Union could be in danger of breaking up because of the sheer centrifugal forces that could drive the weaker parts away uh, from the stronger parts. In fact, it's more likely to be the stronger parts deciding they've had enough of the weaker parts and want to get rid of them. And so we could see, say, in 10 years' time, if we have a big slump between now and then, which we probably will, the possibility that you'd have a euro based just on the northern European states and the others will be floating out on their own. It would seem the only way that you would end up with a kind of a, a fiscal method in the euro would be if you had a crisis in severe crisis in the centre of Germany or, or France, where they would wish to have some fiscal help from the other countries, and then it would get pushed through. Yeah, and at the moment that... Um... Yeah, and that were, so if, if Germany and France were sufficiently weakened that they required the help of the whole Europe and Eurozone, that would be a different situation. Much more likely is the other way around. We see at the moment what is called the rise of populism. Uh, by that we mean elements within all these countries who feel that the further integration of the European Union, the free movement of labour, the redistribution of revenues and a fiscal union is a bad idea, and they want to go back to the nation state where they sort of run their own thing and close up their borders in autarky. Uh, that's, that's a view of populism which is gr growing in strength as a result of the long depression we've had over the last 10 years. And the next slump is more likely to produce a decisive dis uh, moment where either uh, there will be a move by the strong countries to a full integration in order to unite uh, the Eurozone in one block, weak and strong, or uh, more likely a breakup of the Eurozone. So, Michael, is there anything then in the book that we haven't discussed that you'd like to have a talk about before we wrap up? I think we covered just about all. I would say that um, we haven't, I haven't get, given away too much, I hope, with the teasing. Um, I will point out some of the other areas that we have not discussed, which are in the book. I mean, geographic areas, like what hap what's been happening in Brazil, what's been happening in Japan. And also, I'll just plug my own chapter on the United Kingdom, where we look at, I looked at the profitability of capital in the United Kingdom going way back, starting in 1855, down about the time when Marx was writing, up to now, to show the changes in the rate of profit, and also how that linked with the health of the British economy. And you can, I think you can see in that chapter a very clear connection between changes in the rate of profit and the decline of British capitalism as the leading economic capitalist power in the middle of the 19th century to where it is now, a second-rate, second-tier capitalist power in complete confusion about whether it should be within the European Union or not, as we have this disastrous Brexit squabble, which continues into 2019. I have one quick question to ask you on how you calculated your rate of profit for the UK. Not so much how you did it, but I was wondering if you'd read a paper by Alan Freeman where he discussed using and including the money capital to, you, to calculate the rate of profit and the effect that had on the UK rate of profit as he calculated. I was wondering what your thoughts on his method and the validity of it. Yes, uh, um, Alan makes uh, Alan Freeman is a well-known Marxist economist. If the readers and listeners don't know, has done a lot of very good work over the years. He's it was an innovative idea to try and see if he could see if there was an underlying fall in the rate of profit, which wasn't visible on the data. If he included all the not just uh, the cost the capitalists have in uh, all the investments they've made in what we call tangible assets, namely factories, offices, equipment. Uh, and all forms of technology, but also add in all the debt that they had, all the asset or debt or liabilities they had that they've borrowed 
And if you put that on the bottom line as well, does that mean that the rate of problem has fallen? And he shows that it does. I think this is an incorrect way of measuring it because it it's, it's leaves only one side of the equation. If you if you bring in the financial worth of a company as well, you have to look not only at their liabilities but also their assets. You have to basically look at their net worth. So uh, if you do that, if you introduce the net worth, then you get don't get quite the same result that Alan gets. And I think it's uh, also dangerous to well not dangerous but it's uh, it's confusing if you bring financial debt or financial assets into your equation because those things are what Marx called very fictitious in other words they're not real assets they are only depend upon what the market thinks of something at any particular time and they can easily collapse as we've seen in the last month a massive collapse in the stock market does that mean that the value of productive capital has collapsed in the last month when the stock market falls 20 percent no it just means that people's uh, estimate and claim to that real productive value has collapsed so that they want to get their money back they, and they're selling it in the stock market they're going to make a loss but the actual productive uh, value in factories and offices and so on hasn't changed because of that change in the stock market so i think using the stock market and bringing financial assets like bonds into the equation is more confusing than real and i don't think that alan's approach works well thanks very much michael for coming on the show today you know you're a stalwart on the show it's great to have you back well thank you tom and i hope uh, we'll be in contact soon On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Chesters, and you are now listening to The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. Music